church age ends as soon as the rapture happens. Because without a church, there's no more church age, right? So the church is taken out at the beginning of the tribulation. Then we've got that seven-year period to introduce the millennium. Or if the church is raptured at the midpoint or at the end of the tribulation, whatever you believe, the church age lasts until the church is taken out of here. And so then we're going to talk next week about the various rapture theories and uh, uh, what, what the biblical basis is for each one of them. But for this physical kingdom of Christ to begin, there has to be an end to the church age. Jesus Christ reigns in the church today. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? He reigns in the church today. He is already fulfilling his role as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to the church today. He reigns. He does not reign over Israel yet. So when the reign of Christ in the church on the earth is done, the reign of Christ in Israel can begin. Okay? Four, there will be a time of tribulation on the earth that will precede the second coming of Christ to establish his kingdom. Note the different word, the second coming of Christ. Two separate events that are predicted in the New Testament. The coming of Christ for the church and the second coming of Christ as the king of Israel. Two separate comings. And we'll look at that next week when we evaluate the words for his appearing and his coming. Okay? Uh, Titus says uh, that we are to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. What does that word appearing there mean? What does it mean when we talk about the second coming of Christ? What's different about the second coming from what I believe is a separate event called the rapture. Okay? The rapture can't be the second coming because it doesn't match the first coming. Do you understand? What happened at the first coming? He was here literally, physically, on the earth, put his feet down. And he was here and lived here. That's not going to happen in the rapture. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, where do we meet for the rapture? In the air. His feet never touch the ground. So that's not the second coming because it doesn't match the first coming. If you're going to call it the second of anything, you know, the, uh, you, you wouldn't want the sequel to Indiana Jones to not star Indiana Jones. <laughs> right? You're looking for Indiana Jones. You know, over the years, how many different James Bonds have there been? We look for the next James Bond movie to come out. Well, I wonder who's starring in it this time. You know, we've got to create a new character in our minds all of a sudden. No, you want the second coming to match the first coming, and so it will. It does nothing to do with the rapture. So at some time at the end of the tribulation, there will be a physical second coming of Christ to the earth to set up his kingdom. Number five. During that kingdom period, Satan will be physically bound and have no access to the earth. Phew, won't that be fun? Yes. Man, that'll be just awesome. That'll be wonderful. Yes. Are the rest of, I guess, the demons or whatever you want to call them, are they bound at that point? Because it doesn't, I, I don't remember it saying scripturally that they are. It doesn't, but if Satan is bound in a bottomless pit, uh, you have to understand that Satan is not omnipresent. Mm -hmm. He can't be everywhere at once. And if he's bound in a bottomless pit, how does he roam the earth seeking whom he may devour? And how does he give directions to his demons who are doing that for him? Because he can't be everywhere at once. Okay. If, uh, if Bertha was just tempted to do something, and she said, oh, the devil made me do that. And I'm over here going, the devil made me do that. One of us is wrong. Because <laughs> the devil can't be over there and here at the same time. 
He can't be. He's a created being. He has limitations. So when he's bound and thrown into that bottomless pit, he has no access to the earth. Now, his demons, that's a good question. I'm going to have to study on that one as to what's going on with them. We do know, uh, we do know that uh, from reading Isaiah, uh, and we're going to talk about this when we get into a study of Revelation later on, and we start working our way through the book of Revelation, and when we get to the end and we talk about the Millennial Kingdom, and we start looking at the prophecies from the Old Testament that talk about what that Millennial Kingdom is like, and you'll discover that there's some interesting things in the Millennial Kingdom. For example, you know, people will live again like they lived prior to Noah for the whole thousand years. Yeah, there's, there's not going to be any death except for one thing, rebellion against the king, which means that humans will still choose to rebel against Jesus. Because it says in Isaiah that up until the age of 100, the age of 100 will become the age of accountability in the millennial kingdom. You get the first 100 years to choose if you're going to follow the king or not. And if you rebel against the king, by the time you're 100 years old, if you make the choice to rebel against the king, you're done. You're killed. You're out of here. So what does that tell you about the nature of sin? It's not the fault of Satan. It's not the fault of the demons. The nature of sin exists within us, within the human soul. The nature of sin was corrupted the moment Adam and Eve chose to want the knowledge of good and evil. Now the demons can choose to influence your flesh to make you do things or to ask you to do things that your flesh is thinking of anyway. But Satan, Satan doesn't, and this is an interesting concept, but Satan doesn't invent ways for you to sin. You don't need any help with that. You don't need any help with that. That comes from your heart. What Satan does and his demons do is they say, oh, I see what John's thinking about. Let's jump on that horse and help him ride it. Okay? But they can do that with more than one person at a time. I'm just, I'm going back to what you said about if he's affecting your life over here and the way you're thinking and he's affecting Bertha's life over there, that he can't be both places at the same time, but he can have that effect on both of you at the same time. Uh, he, through his demons work, yes. Yeah, see, see here, here's, the way I like, here's the way I like to think about it, okay? And, and again, this, this, could be, this could be totally just a simplistic way to look at it so that I can get on with life. But, uh, but it, it makes sense to me, okay? The scriptures say that out of the, out of the depth of the flesh of the heart comes all sin. That in my flesh, I don't need any help thinking about what to do that's wrong to satisfy the desires of my own flesh. I can't blame Satan for giving me that thought. That thought was generated by my heart choosing that thought. Because my heart is wicked. Desperately so. Okay? But Satan roams around the earth seeking whom he may devour with what he sees us already interested in. And he comes and he capitalizes on what we're doing with either himself or with his demons. And sometimes he capitalizes even against their will through demonic possession. And that's why Jesus came to set those free who were in the bondage of Satan. I mentioned that on Sunday in my sermon, remember? He set free those who were in bondage to Satan. How many demons did that one guy have? His name was Legion. He had a thousand demons in him who said, man, this guy's flesh is really right. Let's devour him with the desires of his flesh. Okay? But the origination of all those desires, that's me. That's why... No, I, I, I can't put anybody else to stand in front of God as my defender and 
say, they made me do it. They made me do it. Could Satan set up situations where you have to make that decision? Oh, I believe, yeah. I believe he, he does. He did with Job. He asked God for permission. He said, oh, that guy isn't all that righteous. You've just so blessed him. Why wouldn't he follow you? Let me take all the blessing away and see if he still follows you. His wife didn't, but he did. You know, his wife said, curse God and die. Job said, nope. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But Satan was trying to get him into a situation where he would be able to devour what God was trying to do in his life. Satan will be bound during this whole period. No influence. None needed. The flesh is sufficient. Number six, there will be distinct resurrections for the saved and the unsaved, distinct judgments for both, and distinct times of determining each's eternal state. This is different from the amillennialist that says everybody gets resurrected at once, separation of the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares, and at the same instant that God is saying to one, go to hell, he's saying to me, enter into my presence. <coughs> It'll all happen in one event. And I see distinct events in Scripture. Literally distinct events. I see the judgment seat of Christ, where all followers of Christ will be reviewed in their lives so they can be given their eternal rewards. And I see the great white throne judgment, which is for unsaved people only. I see two separate judgments, two separate events, two separate resurrections. Revelation says there'll be a separate resurrection of all the dead that are resurrected for the great white throne judgment. Separate resurrection from mine and yours, if you're a believer in Christ. So. There, there's a huge difference in how we read scripture and what we're looking forward to and what we think God is going to do if we're amillennialist and we interpret it figuratively or if we're premillennial and we interpret it literally. Uh, premillennialism is attractive to people today, growing in, uh, in popularity all the time uh, right now in the world, in, in Christian circles. It's attractive because... Uh, it appears to maintain the integrity of all Scripture. And it encourages dependence on Jesus because Satan is still powerfully active in the world. And in this view, the church is viewed as an organism rather than an organization, placing more emphasis on the spiritual life of the believer. All right. That's premillennialism and amillennialism and the dispensations, and that puts us all the way up to after this thousand-year reign of Christ, the judgment of the great white throne judgment when all ungodly people will be sent to the lake of fire, and all of this creation will be ultimately and absolutely destroyed, not a particle left of it anywhere. The same God who created it out of nothing will return it to nothing. There won't be any ash residue left floating around the universe. There'll be no more universe. At the end of this judgment, after the resurrection, in the 21st and 22nd chapters of Revelation, absolutely everything <coughs> is destroyed that's in existence right now, except lives of those who know Jesus. Amen. That's the only thing that survives. That's it. Everything else is absolutely obliterated into nothingness again. It's uncreated. And then a new heaven and a new earth are created. Never again ever to be tainted by sin. Never ever again to be flawed in any way. Yes? Lake of Fire still exists? The Lake of Fire will still exist, I believe. Yep. In some dimension that God puts it where it has no contact with the new dimension that he creates of a physical world for all of us in heaven. What did I? So, so that's uh, where we're going to pick up next week. <clears throat> we're going to pick up 
right here. The translation and resurrection of the just. We're going to talk about who gets raptured. Because, believe it or not, there are actually theories that teach. There's one theory called the partial rapture that teaches that not everybody in the church or in the desert, not every Christian gets raptured. Did you know that? No. There's a theory that's promoted by some that says that not every Christian gets raptured. Some have to stay and go through the tribulation because they didn't believe correctly or they didn't believe sufficiently. And I'm not going to give it away. You see if you can find it. See if you can find out just for the fun of it for next week what the condition is as to whether you'll get raptured or not for the partial rapture theorist. So is it in the Bible? Um, they take a couple of verses in the Bible and they turn it into the condition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we'll talk about the pre-trib rapture, the mid-trib rapture, the pre-wrath rapture, and the post-trib rapture. And we'll try to figure out how they all believe what they believe and why. And then you can come to your own conclusions. Any questions? Uh, yes, I, I'm hoping to have papers for all of those next week. Okay. All right. Stopping the recording. Nice. 59 minutes. Shut this off. I'm getting better at this. Too bad I can't do it on Sundays. I know that's what you were thinking.